Second part of the legislative branch, we're going to look at how bills are proposed and become law uh, in all the ways they cannot uh, be stopped. We'll also talk about uh, how Congress actually, um, how the parties inside of Congress operate, roughly speaking. Um, and you get an idea for what Madison was warning about there. Uh, and then we'll also talk about briefly <clears throat> the state and local level, uh, direct democracy in some states. And then we'll finish up with um, the process of reapportionment every 10 years and that goes with the cen uh, census. And that, that's pretty much going to conclude our overview of all the proceedings and details about the uh, legislative branch. We'll, of course, be calling back and referring back to it uh, at other points in the class. But that, it, watching these two videos will pretty much give you a good idea of exactly what it looks like and what it does uh, and how it operates. So, legislative branch, um, we're talking about how these bills actually become a law. Um, it's going to be a little more complicated than what I lay out. Um, there will be some details omitted just for sake of brevity. Uh, plus, I'll give you every single detail. There's no way anyone's going to remember that. You might not remember it anyway. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I will attempt to explain simply the general process for how uh, a bill, which is, you know, a drafted potential law, is crafted, voted on, and, and, and becomes a law itself. So, if uh, a member of Congress, be in the House, the Senate, wants to propose a bill, uh, any of them can do it. They can draft one themselves, or they can take a you know, submission from another committee or, uh, or, or organization or individual, however much, whatever way they procure it, uh, they can, of course, draft it and then propose it themselves. So uh, we have, of course, the drafting of a bill, draft um, a bill, and that that's, um, could be done by anybody, uh, but it's gonna be formally introduced or proposed uh, by a, a member of Congress. Uh, so that can be by anyone. Um, generally, of course, we're going to want to have somebody that knows what they're doing write this out. It's got to be legally sound and uh, grammatically correct and, and, and make sense. And all that will sort of make sense. We'll get to that. All right. Uh, and then it's introduced. Introduced. And generally speaking, the person that uh, introduces it to the House or the Senate, that's going to be the sponsor, and, and anybody else can uh, join in and endorse it as a co-sponsor. Introduced by a sponsor, and that, of course, has to be a, uh, a Congress uh, rep. All right, and, and any co-sponsors that they have, any other congressman or congresswoman that they have, and co-sponsors. Uh, easy so far. So drafted, introduced. Now it gets a little bit more complicated. So what they're going to do is they're going to take some people uh, in the House or the Senate, whoever it's proposed to or introduced to, uh, and they generally have committees that are uh, constituted by members of that House, whatever House or Senate, uh, that are generally interested in or have some knowledge about the topic. So let's say it's a bill about health care, for example. Uh, you've got a niche of Congress people that are interested in health care uh, that either uh, form the committee or, or can form the committee on that basis. So uh, the committee is generally small, and it's going to be a mix of members that are interested in or have some knowledge of whatever the topic is. Uh, so that is going to, the bill is going to go to committee. Bill goes to committee. And this is where they're going to review it and um, look to make changes and find out information about, you know, what things are possible and uh, get some potentially some opinions by experts. Of course, we could put the experts in quotes because it depends on the person uh, and their affiliations sometimes. Nonetheless, they can call on experts. Uh, they can call on anybody really for, the, for advice on these uh, uh, committees. So that's what's called a hearing. Um, that's where they're going to take the advice or counsel uh, of others on the topic. So that's where you would potentially uh, hear from other members of Congress, you from the executive branch, uh, you could hear from experts in the field, like I mentioned. Uh, in fact, you can actually designate it to a subcommittee uh, that could take it and review it themselves, maybe a more focused um, uh, set of people, of eyes, and they can propose changes and things like that. Uh, uh, so I'll put that as a, technically consider that next step, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider it as part of this one, at least for us. Uh, or you can uh, submit it to a to, or delegate it to a subcommittee. All right, uh, those are your options. And they would, of course, uh, make their, uh, propose their advice, their changes, or make their changes. 
and go back to the committee and they would uh, decide whether to uh, keep those changes uh, or not. Uh, so let's say that it does. Uh, you're going to have, uh, you, you get the thing back and you know, they do or they don't keep the, the changes or suggestions uh, from the subcommittee or the hearing. Uh, they're going to make their markups nonetheless. And almost never do you have a bill that's drafted and introduced just go unchanged all the way through. It's almost always going to be changed in some uh, manner. Uh, so the committee. Uh, this is where the, you're going to have the committee markup phase. Uh, markup, I mean, it's literally just like a teacher grading a paper, they're going to mark it up. Uh, they're going to, uh, you know, cross things out. Obviously, everybody's going to have a copy, so it's not like a, one original. And, oh, we crossed that out. We don't know what it said. They're going to put it out there. And, um, oh, I actually forgot to mention, when it gets uh, introduced, uh, that gets put online, too, so the public can see it. But it's not that relevant. Um, this is where they would mark it up and uh, make any changes that they would uh, like, whether it's omitting things or changing the wording or adding things. Uh, and this is where it can get tricky uh, because this is where the committee uh, that, that we mentioned here that the bill goes to, uh, like I said, they can, they can apply changes here or, or suggestions here if they want, but here's to actually make those changes or adopt them. Um, this is where people can um, decide to add things that might not even be related to the topic. These are called riders. Um, I'll put can. This doesn't mean they're always, it's always added. These are always added, but they can be can add what are called riders. And these are uh, deceitful little things because, um, as their name kind of implies, uh, they're a rider, they're attached to this thing, but they don't necessarily belong, right? Um, so let's say it is a, a bill about healthcare, and a lot of these bills can be really extensive, like anywhere from like 10 to, to 2,000 pages uh, of, uh, of legalese, like writing that's intentionally misleading or full of jargon, so it's hard to, to read like a, a whole, whole paragraph that essentially says nothing, um, but it has a bunch of words filling it up. Uh, they can try to insert things called writers that have nothing to do with the actual bill's original intent, uh, but that they want included and added to law. So let's say it was about healthcare, but they wanted, I don't know, they wanted to add some firearms limitation or, or take away a firearms limitation. Uh, they could randomly put it in there in part of the uh, bill and hope nobody notices it or, or, or enough people don't notice it so that this thing does become law. You have this healthcare thing, but then they also have this random part about either taking away uh, guns rights or, or uh, adding more guns rights or whatever it might be. Uh, that would be a rider. And those, uh, uh, those, those could be a deceitful mechanism for... Um, adding things that don't belong to the bill. Uh, I remember, I don't really read the legislation, but I remember when they proposed the, uh, um, uh, the Green New Deal, uh, I wanted to see what, what some parts of it were. And it's really long. Uh, and I first looked to a summary, then I looked to see if it was actually there. Uh, and they just looked for yourself. They added quite a few things that have nothing to do with the environment whatsoever. Um, so I just kind of chuckled. Like, ah, that's typical. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's what a um, uh, committee markup uh, is, and that's when they could add these writers. So let's say they do mark it up, uh, they would vote in their committee uh, to either report it, which would mean it would actually go to the uh, floor, the actual real vote, whether it's the House, the Senate, where this thing uh, is introduced, uh, or they would uh, not report it. So uh, I actually skipped one on accident already. Um, if they don't report it, the bill just stops there, it's dead. I forgot to mention that if the committee doesn't act on it, like they don't have to have a hearing or subcommittee, they don't do anything, they could just ignore it. Uh, that would potentially uh, leave the bill dead in the water. It could, as they refer to it, is kill uh, the bill. Uh, so I should note that here. If no action, bill dies. Uh, same thing here, if they don't report it, or not report it, uh, if not reported, bill dies. All right, so um, well, let's, let's use an example here. So you got the Senate, you got the House, right? And we'll say it starts with the House. So you have somebody, uh, a rep drafts a bill, a uh, bill on, uh, on healthcare. Uh, it would go through this, this process here. So they introduce it to the, to the House, then they'd form a committee. That would go to a House committee. And that House Committee would, you know, have the hearing, uh, submit it to the, the subcommittee, and they make their markups. Uh, and that's what they go through, three to four here. 
Uh, and let's say uh, they do report it, although it could uh, die here by uh, not even going to the committee, and the committee themselves could, could kill it as well. So um, once they made the markups, uh, that's when they are going to um, uh, issue or report it uh, to the actual house floor. So that, let's say they do, they report it, uh, and then it's going to actually go to the house itself uh, for debate. That'd be step five. They're going to uh, have the, what's called the floor, the floor meaning like literally the chamber uh, full of either house members or senate uh, members. Uh, they're going to uh, have a floor debate where they are, of course, going to all have a chance to look at it. Uh, they'll have um, uh, a debate on it potentially. So you might have, um, whether it's the he's Speaker of the House, House of Representatives, or it's the President Pro Tempore or the uh, uh, just the majority leader uh, that s begins the process of people giving them the chance to talk, um, they are going to debate like whether they think it's a good idea or not or think they should take some things off or, or whatever uh, it might be that they're going to do. Uh, so at that point, they're going to vote to either add or keep the markups or not keep them, whichever ones they are, uh, and then they're going to vote on passing it or not. So floor debate and votes. And here, of course, they're going to debate uh, and vote on the amendments, the changes, the markups essentially. Uh, and then the uh, uh, bill itself. So obviously it could die here as well. Uh, could uh, could fail to pass, and then it would die. And uh, just to pass a bill, not not override a veto, uh, it's just a, a simple majority. So as long as they're one over 50%, whether it's you know 50.1% or whatever it might be, uh, as long as it's over 50, that's the majority that they need. So that's what happens inside of, of the one single chamber. All right, so boom, this thing goes to House, they uh, argue and add or take away the amendments, uh, and they pass the bill, yay. Uh, then it's gonna go on to the next House uh, where they're going to uh, offer their own suggestions and changes on it. Where's my erase it? There it is. Their own uh, changes on it. All right, let's say they wanna make some changes. They could form what's called a conference committee. Oh, I should actually get this written up here. Six. Um, so it goes to the other house. Um, so uh, introduce the other house. Uh, where they could, um, House of Congress, where they could vote on it directly and pass it or, or decline it. Uh, or they can uh, form a, um, oh, I just forgot, conference committee. There we go. Uh, conference committee would be where basically uh, some senators and House committee members uh, mix, so either it gets approved and voted, uh, or they have their uh, conference committee. I should make this a little bigger. Senate conference committee. And here's where they would, uh, of course, uh, try to hammer out some of the differences between the two and come to some sort of compromise. Uh, and it could die there as well. But let's say that it doesn't, uh, just for sake of this example. Uh, and that is when both houses have voted on the potential changes. So that would be a uh, decide slash vote on changes slash compromise. And again, let's say that it does. Yay, both houses pass it. Uh, on through that goes to the next step, which is the president. And that's where the president has a chance to kill the bill as well. So there's been a way to kill in every step since step three. Uh, the committee can just do nothing that it dies. Um, they cannot report it to the floor so that it would die after a committee or subcommittee uh, takes place and does markups. And then on the actual floor of the House or the Senate where it started, it's introduced, uh, it could die there. Uh, and then it could also die when it goes to the next House if they can't, uh, they vote it down or they can't compromise on it. And now it can die uh, in the hands of the president, potentially. So then it is uh, passed on to the president. And uh, he or she has got a couple of choices here. So first of all, they could sign into law. And there it goes, easy one, right through. Uh, they could also not sign it. And then after 10 days, it becomes law. Days becomes law. So they, that's something that they would do is if, you know, they believed that both houses of Congress would override their veto potentially, uh, so, but they don't want to like put their name on it, like they don't like the law for whatever reason. Uh, so then they would just 
either ignore it because they didn't have the time or, or whatever, or they did disagree with it, but they, didn't, they knew it was futile to veto, uh, so they would just let it go through without their signature. Uh, but it becomes a law nonetheless if he, if he or she doesn't do anything about it. Um, or uh, the president can uh, suggest changes and send back. And send back to Congress. Here's where the veto comes in. Because if the, um, well, there's actually two ways. This is the first way, though. Uh, so he's got to do this within 10 days, obviously. Uh, but if, within 10 days, I'll actually add that. In 10 days. There we go. Um, by sending it back, that, that's essentially the veto. Uh, and the um, <clears throat> House and Senate have to make the changes uh, or potentially uh, just vote to override uh, by a two-thirds majority. Uh, and that would be, be step eight on how to actually pass it. Um, but I do want to come back here for a second. Um, if returned two-thirds of both houses can override the veto. Um, there's one other way that they can kind of circumvent this. Uh, let's say the president believes that they would have a two-thirds override. Um, but he wants to, or she wants to veto it. There's a thing called pocket veto, where if you hold on to it until the House and Senate of Congress adjourns and they're not in session, and then you send it back to them, if it's still in that little 10-day window, then um, the bill would die, even if Congress passed it, uh, because they would send them back for these uh, uh, changes, but since Congress isn't there, once those 10 days are up, uh, then the bill would die, because the president had signed it, sent it back within the 10-day window, but Congress wasn't there uh, to vote on overriding it, so then that bill would also die. Uh, so could use a pocket veto. And they call it a pocket veto because it's almost like he or she is taking the, the, the bill, crumpling it in their pocket, and just having it sit there and waiting until Congress goes home, and then they give it back for changes, and, and then it ends up dying. Uh, so yeah, that's called a pocket veto. I shouldn't underline that. My pocket veto. There we go. Uh, and then, of course, there's the two thirds override option. So that's how a, a bill can become a law. And at every step, since at least three that I mentioned up here, uh, these things can uh, die. Uh, so it's very difficult to actually get a law to go through. Um, uh, even when it gets to this point, it can be difficult. So that is how a bill becomes a law in the United States through the Congress. But, like I mentioned before, um, all these laws can be overturned, potentially, by the Supreme Court if um, somebody finds them unconstitutional and, and then uh, uh, appeals it all the way up to the Supreme Court uh, to determine whether the law is constitutional or not. And that's another way. That wouldn't be killing the bill because it's still a law at that point, but the law could be overturned by the Supreme Court. Okay, so next I'm talking about, oh, how it actually works inside of the Congress. And this was a major fear of Madison if you remember from Federal, Federalist Paper 10, we talked about that. He warned against factionalism or parties, political parties in this case. Uh, and I, would, I, I think that most founding fathers would agree uh, that none of them wanted factions to uh, dominate American politics. Uh, they generally wanted you as an individual to look at all the options and vote according to your own conscience, like what evidence you had and, and all of that. They did not want somebody picking votes for you to vote in blocks, even though you disagree with something. Uh, that's called partisanship, where you're uh, voting strictly according to what your party believes. So like if you're a Republican or a Democrat, you've got specific views on abortion and gun control and, and, and economics and all of these concepts. So if I'm a Democrat, I'm gonna be strongly encouraged uh, to vote in Congress with all of the other Democrats, uh, rather than according to my own beliefs. Uh, and, and the odds that every single one of those members of Congress truly believes every single thing on their party platform uh, is pretty low. Same for Republicans, though. Uh, even, though I, even if I might disagree with a particular Republican view, um, and the, my uh, peers are all in Congress are voting one way, I'm going to be encouraged to vote along with them, even if I disagree. Uh, so this is where, again, Madison's warning is really uh, manifesting itself, uh, and here's how it works. And they literally operate overtly like this, which is, which is kind of absurd. All right, so uh, inside Congress, 
uh, I'll say party, uh, party, political party, political party, behaviors, not behaviors, uh, practices, there we go. So contrary to what uh, people were hoping when they designed the Declaration of Independence, or designed the Constitution, uh, in Articles too, but certainly the Constitution, they didn't want factions. Um, however, uh, what we have here is uh, American politics anyway. American politics is largely dominated by partisanship. And that is again where you uh, uh, vote with uh, party members in uh, unison. Even if you disagree with what they're voting for. Uh, so it's kind of like a quid pro quo, like you might disagree with something, but in order to get everybody else to vote for the things you do like, you kind of have to vote for some things that you don't like. Like let's take a, a typical Republican view is pro-life and a typical Republican view is uh, more, less gun restrictions. Let's say you happened to believe abortion was okay, but you were really uh, adamant about Second Amendment rights. So you as a Republican, even though you might want to vote or at least not vote or not care about abortion issues. Uh, if you do that, then your party members uh, are going to potentially disown you or not vote with you on the guns rights stuff. Uh, so uh, to sort of uh, act in a partisan manner would be for you to vote with all the other Republicans on abortion, even if you don't feel that way about abortion, so that you guys all agree on the thing you do care about, which would be gun rights or, or whatever the issue might be. So uh, that's, that's what partisanship is. So, uh, and they actually operate like this specifically because in each uh, House, the Senate or Congress, uh, or sorry, the Senate or the House of Representatives, uh, they're going to uh, have specific leaders uh, and members that make sure people are voting in a block as a party, uh, even if they disagree with individually their conscience or whatever disagrees with the particular bill or, or the way they're voting. So in Senate and House, uh, you have what are called majority leaders uh, or minority leaders. I'm not talking racially here. Uh, and then you also have majority uh, whips or whip slash minority whip. And when I say majority minority, Again, I'm not talking like uh, racial or, or other uh, ethnic or demographic minority. I'm talking specifically about political parties. So if I've got a Senate, for example, it's got 100 people, and uh, 60 are Republican and 40 are uh, Democratic, you're going to have some in independents in there and, and whatnot, but just, let's just pretend it's just, this, just those two. Uh, the majority uh, leader and whip would come from the Republicans, and the minority leader and whip would come from uh, the Democrats. But let's say you uh, look at the House, uh, and that's, of course, going to be out of did I write 10 up there. I meant to write 100. Maybe I did. I don't remember. Um, 435 here in the House of Representatives. So let's say you had uh, 200 Republicans and 235 Democrats. Then the, in the House, the majority leader and the majority whip would come from the Democrats, and the minority leader and whip would come from the Republicans. It just depends. And if the next election is flip-flops to uh, 200 Democrats and 235 Republicans, uh, they would obviously flip uh, and switch. Okay, so you're like, well, what do these guys do? Uh, well, first of all, uh, the way they're chosen is the members of Congress hold what's generally referred to as, called, it's called a caucus, where kind of people inside of a party get together and they decide uh, who they want to support or, or endorse. And that way they're all voting as one. Because let's say, for example, all the Democrats uh, were split and they voted for like people that they liked or themselves or whoever, they would have like 20 uh, suggestions for their majority or minority leader. Uh, but the Republicans though, they let's say they had a caucus and they chose somebody, they would all vote for the one person and their person would make it uh, as the um, uh, leader of that uh, um, House of Congress. So they become the Speaker of the House, potentially, uh, or the um, Majority Leader of the um, Senate. Okay, so what do they do? Majority Leader, uh, they're going to be the official representative of the uh, party. So like when 
they're making public statements about how the Republicans feel as a Republican or the Democrats feel as a Democrat, they're going to uh, listen to the majority or minority leader uh, to get an idea of what the Republicans or the Democrats want or how they feel about an issue, whatever it might be. Uh, but also, uh, especially if they're a majority leader, they're going to uh, um, have some uh, choice, I guess, choice or power, I guess you say, choice slash uh, power on speaking order. So if you're having like a, a floor debate, speaking order. So uh, step six, when like say that, or not even step six, just even step five, when it goes to the floor for debate in the House, for example, or the Senate, wherever it is, uh, the Speaker of the House or the Majority Leader or the President Pro Temp or the uh, um, Senate, they choose who speaks uh, first. Uh, and when you have the floor, you're not supposed to be interrupted. Um, the uh, House has a time limit, but the Senate does not have a time limit on how long you can speak. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but they're the ones that can sort of choose that. Um, and they are the ones that handle the, the proceedings. And that can be influential, potentially, uh, for who they're hearing, who they're not hearing, and, and, and all of that. So that's something that's uh, an important issue. That's why they have the caucus, by the way, to choose. Because if, let's say, the majority party couldn't agree on somebody, but the minority party all voted together, then that would, person could potentially become the, the Speaker of the House or, uh, or, or, or whatnot. Actually, I'm not sure on that. They might have to have an, app, an actual majority for all of Congress to get it, or through all their house to get it. That one I'm not quite sure on, but nonetheless, you want to, at least now in Congress, you want to be unified uh, under uh, one person. All right, majority whip, uh, or uh, minority whip, sometimes they're called the assistants, but because um, they're like the second most important person, I guess you could say. Uh, this is the person who is designated for um, ensuring partisan voting. So they're the ones that uh, make sure enough members from their party are there for a particular vote, because you can actually vote uh, with not all members there, as long as there's a quorum, like a, a, enough people to vote on a bill. It doesn't have to be everyone that's there. They want to make sure that you are there uh, in case they want to oppose it or pass it. Uh, and they also compel you to vote with the party, uh, not individually. So if you're somebody who is voting on your own without regard for what the party wants, or at least the party leader wants and, and leadership wants, uh, they are going to try to convince you otherwise, uh, and they're going to, of course, um, uh, I don't want to say blackmail because that's not correct, but they're not going to support you going forward. So bills you introduce, they're not going to support and back. Um, uh, votes that maybe you or people with uh, interests you have, uh, they're not going to support uh, as a voting block, whereas they might uh, otherwise. Uh, and they can also use that against you uh, to support somebody else from your district um, later on by showing, oh, look, uh, if it's a majority Republican district, for example, they'd be like, oh, look, Joe here doesn't vote with Republicans. Uh, look at all of these examples of him voting with Democrats. Or, you know, if it was a Democratic district, they could, they could come to the, uh, the, 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 they could campaign against them uh, in the House of the Senate. Be like, oh, look, uh, this Democratic rep uh, doesn't even vote with us. He or she voted with Republicans this many times. Uh, we should vote with this Democrat instead. They might endorse and help somebody else out in your place. Uh, so that's how they, they sort of ensure it uh, with attendance and uh, uh, party votes. But again, uh, these are gonna be uh, chosen, determined during a caucus. And again, a caucus is like an in-party uh, vote to choose uh, delegates or leaders. Uh, and you can have those too on a local scale. Um, or a local uh, um, scope, scale is probably a better word for it, uh, where they, they choose to endorse certain uh, representatives or delegates uh, for uh, presidential elections. Uh, that's where like the Republican National Convention or the Democratic National Convention, uh, that's kind of what they, uh, what function that they, they serve. Okay, so that's what they do to make sure people are voting uh, in a, along party lines. And of course, we all know, uh, if you remember from Federal, Federal Speaker 10, that is exactly what Madison did not want to happen and wanted to prevent. So thankfully, we do have some uh, checks and balances to make sure that uh, these block partisan voting uh, entities uh, can't just uh, annihilate our individual uh, rights. So that is how that process goes. I'm trying to think if I wanted to say anything else about it. Oh, I want to add one more part, and I mentioned it already. There is a time limit if I'm in the House on, on how long I can speak. But there isn't for the Senate. So the people that would call that out, 
uh, and, and regulate it, deciding who's speaking and for how long and if they're violating these rules or not. Uh, in the House, the leader is uh, what's referred to as the Speaker of the House. Currently, that's Nancy Pelosi. Um, that is the person that is presiding over the, the House of Representatives. Usually, they don't vote or debate. They can, but they traditionally don't for whatever reason. Uh, and uh, they're the ones that, I guess, to be more impartial, that's probably a good thing. But they're the ones, again, that to peek who speaks and all that. And they're the ones that enforce the norms of the House and Senate, which, according to the Constitution, the House and the Senate can sort of choose themselves as far as, like, uh, the rules they have and what members can and can't do and, and how, to, how to punish members who are being dissident, uh, whatever it might be. So the Speaker of House would be the one that does that. They're up there picking who speaks and letting them know when they're violating protocol or going over time or whatever it might be. Um, for the Senate... It's supposed to be, and I've mentioned this before, I think anyway, um, it's supposed to be the vice president, but uh, traditionally the vice president actually doesn't do that often. Uh, the vice president will show up, generally speaking, uh, if they think there's going to be a tie or there is a tie uh, on a particular bill or vote, uh, and then uh, that the person will come in, of course, and uh, he or she will cast the tie-breaking vote. That's happened a few times. Has that happened? I can't remember. If, yeah, I think it's happened like 200-something times. So it's, I guess on average, it's roughly once a year, if I remember that correctly. Um, that's been in my brain for a while, so that might not be correct. But I think it's 200-something times the VP's come in and done a cast a, cast a tie-breaking vote. Um, so he's not often there, though. So usually that's going to go to um, uh, either the president pro tempore, which is the, um, uh, the, the senior, which means the longest presiding senator of the, the majority party, uh, or the majority leader for the Senate. Um, sometimes they're the same person, sometimes they're not. Uh, but I think right now the majority leader for the Senate is Mitch McConnell. I forget who it is. I, I haven't done a very good job of, of keeping track of, of who's, who's who. Um, nonetheless, uh, that's, that's how it uh, runs. This is President for Temporary uh, and or the majority leader. And uh, like I said, time limit here on how much you can speak. So when, like I said, when a bill does come to the floor and they're debating it and they're going to vote on it, there's a time limit in the House uh, and there are rules and procedures and the Speaker would be the one that enforces them. Uh, but in the Senate, there is no time limit. So here uh, you have what's uh, possibly, you, you could delay a bill with, uh, by using a filibuster is what it's called. And a filibuster is when you go up there and uh, talk endlessly so that no one else can uh, speak about it, or you can't even actually cast a vote on it. So um, this filibuster cannot be uh, stopped or compelled to stop uh, unless they breach certain rules. So some of the rules are, um, if I'm not mistaken, they can't stop talking at all. Uh, obviously, you can't just only talk and not breathe. You, it's got to be reasonable, but you can't take like these long, drawn-out pauses. You have to remain standing. You can't like lean on things. Um, if you uh, agree to uh, see the floor to somebody else, then they don't have to give it back to you. Uh, if they adjourn for a break, um, then they don't have to give it back to you either. So there's a lot of rules. So it's pretty hardcore. Um, I can't remember what the record was, but I know people have gone for hours on end doing this. Uh, and you don't even have to talk about this is freedom of speech. You don't even have to talk about the bill. You can go up there. Some people have like gone up there and read the newspaper out loud, or they've read the phone book, you know, things like that, told the story, read Dr. Seuss, like all these ridiculous things just to chew up time uh, in hopes of delaying a bill or killing a bill or pushing a bill to the point that Congress adjourns and then even if it is proposed, the president could pocket view to it. Uh, those are the ways that this is used uh, nowadays. Uh, but that's only in the Senate. Got a time limit in the House, Senate, no time limit, so you can. Talk as long as you can, but you can't take a break. Uh, you can't lean. You got to stand. You got to keep talking. So that's how that works, and um, that's how this, the actual voting and uh, partisanship, uh, which again most of us can agree is not a good thing, almost certainly, um, at least in some cases anyway. Uh, probably overall not a good thing, but some some cases it probably is. Um, that's how that takes place. And the last one we'll talk about is uh, specific to the House of Representatives. Uh, it's reapportionment. Well, real quickly before I do that, though, I can tell you, generally speaking, what um, what voting in the legislative branch looks like on the state level. So, um, state level, state legislative uh, level, and local too, but 
each state has their own version of Congress. Um, they, uh, the state constitution gets to choose how that government is, is structured and the, the, the tenets of their constitution. Obviously, they're not allowed to violate the federal uh, U.S. national government's uh, constitution. Um, and most state constitutions look very similar to the U.S. constitution. And so does their actual structure, too. Um, what they're going to have as their legislative branch is what's called a state legislature. The uh, uh, legislature itself might go by a different name, have a different amount of members, be bicameral, whatever it might be. Uh, but nonetheless, the states get to choose it, and there is a state legislature made of representatives from that state. And they make laws, like I mentioned before, specifically about the state. And they have other uh, powers, too, which I'll get to. So state legislature uh, determines state uh, laws and policies according to their own state constitution and also according to the U.S. Constitution. Um, and locally, some states actually have what's called direct democracy in some states. It's different from state to state, so I, I can't even tell you like, exactly how many have direct democracy. Some, uh, in some states, people can vote on propositions and initiatives and just have a popular vote and make it a law, or they can have a popular vote uh, of regular citizens to add a bill to the state legislature for consideration and vote, um, or nothing at all like that. Uh, but that's part of what's called from the progressive era in some states, uh, from progressive era, which you could say lasted from, while the, while the party itself would merge with the Democrats, uh, you could say the move itself went from like the 1880s, 1878 maybe, these when the populists kind of began with their uh, unified complaints against uh, big business and agriculture and railroads uh, till um, 1910s, I would say. By then it had sort of fizzled out, uh, but that's when they're gonna pass a lot of those progressive era amendments, like the one that changes the 17th Amendment, which changes the um, uh, voting procedures for the Senate to being a popular election. That's an example of a direct democracy because uh, it got tired of, of corporations, uh, well, let's just say corporations, companies bribing um, members, crony capitalism. They do things like the uh, state income tax, uh, or sorry, the federal income tax, allowing that, getting rid of the apportionment um, uh, qualifications uh, in the U.S. Constitution. They also banned alcohol, infamously. Uh, and on a good note, they, uh, 19th Amendment, they're the ones that allowed uh, women uh, to partake in the voting system uh, in 1919. So um, that's roughly the progressive era, and they're all about keeping big business out and allowing regular people to influence the government more. So yay them on, on a good chunk of their policies. Um, so they do this through uh, what are called initiatives, initiatives, or referendum votes. And again, those are, uh, and it can be, depending on the scenario of the state, uh, for citizens to make their own laws right out and just put them right into law, uh, or to add uh, to the ballots for the state legislatures to vote on, uh, or, or none at all. Um, California's got quite a few. We have our propositions. Uh, so those of you that are in California, if you see like, vote oh, yes on prop whatever, or no on prop whatever, that's what they're talking about. Um, <clears throat> are these sort of progressive era direct democracy um, initiatives. The reason why I mention that is, these state legislatures, which again are like state congresses, um, they have a major role to play, actually, in the federal government with the House of Representatives because they are the ones in charge of what's called apportionment or reapportionment. So let's uh, discuss what that is real quick as our last portion here, reapportionment. So you're probably like, what the hell is reapportionment? Reapportionment means they're going to change the amount of representatives in each state based on population changes. So let's say for some freak example, every 10 years we take a, a census and say for this freak example, the population stayed exactly the same. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily have to reapportion the um, uh, numbers of house representative members per state. So like California is like a, a big one, for example. Um, so let's say, um, I don't know what it is now in 2020, I haven't been keeping track, but let's say it's 54. So here's California, 54, and let's say Nevada, and I have no idea what Nevada is. Let's say Nevada is 10. So based on the population, I don't think it's that high. Let's say it's eight. 
Now we'll say it's 10 because it's just easy math. Um, and let's change California to 55 so it's easier math too. All right, what that means is in the last census uh, in, uh, in 2010, that based on the population of those 435 uh, house members, California's share of the population gets a little over 10% of those 435 seats uh, and gets 55. Nevada being a smaller state, uh, in proportion to its size of those 435 possible members, uh, gets 10 of them. Uh, so bigger states obviously have more. Texas, New York also have a lot. Uh, smaller states like um, Montana, Alaska, uh, South North Dakota, those are pretty small population states. Not landmass, but population. So they have very low amounts of representatives. The least you can have is one. I think all the states I just mentioned have one except for the Nevada, California, Texas, and, and New York. Um, but that's how it goes. But this can change every 10 years because, like I said, we have a census every 10 years, and we don't just do it for fun. Uh, we do it to know exactly who is where in each state. So uh, we have a uh, census, which, again, is just people uh, reporting how many people in their family and where they live. So we have an idea of how many people there are and where in the United States. Census every 10 years. And they use this info, use census info to reapportion or redistribute because again the proportion of uh, representatives you get in a the state they're redoing that so that's why I call it reapportionment so they're like redistributing the 435 so if the population demographics shift in the United States they take all the 435 back and then they redistribute those or reapportion those say oh California your population went down so in that 55 uh, in in uh, 2020, you're going to have 50. Um, that's how it would go. Proportion the 435 house reps to each state. Um, that's what reapportion means. So let's say you're in a state. I think 43 states have more than one house rep member. I think the seven small states all just have the one. Um, 43 states, though, uh, have to, generally speaking, Reapportion, so like the, as the population shifts, the numbers change, and they're forced to redistrict because what they do to choose your rep members is they have you vote as a block in a uh, congressional district. Um, so it's basically an area in your state where all the people living in that area vote for a specific House representative member. Uh, so let's say you've got California here. Oh, I don't want to draw 55 of these. Let's use Nevada. All right, what did I say they have 10? So here's Nevada, and they've got 10 uh, house reps. So you can draw this however you would want, but you basically just make 10 sections, right? And there you go. Uh, it says 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All right, good, I counted right. And uh, each of them in that district, all the people living in here, and you number them obviously, district 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, all the people from district 1, uh, the majority vote there uh, gets to send a rep to Congress. Majority vote uh, winner from uh, District 2 gets to go to uh, the House of Representatives of Congress. And that's how it works. So let's say we do have a change. So um, Nevada gets a bunch of people from California for some reason. And they go from uh, 10 to 20. They're going to have to redistrict. They're going to have to redraw these lines. So um, in the 43 states with more than one house rep uh, changes result in redistricting. So reapportion means you get a different number in the state, and then redistricting means you need to redraw those boundaries so the people in those boundaries can vote and send the proper number. So if we go from 2010 have 10 reps in uh, Nevada and had a big population growth from California, uh, California would lose um, 10, elect, uh, 10 um, house reps, so they go down to 45, and then um, uh, Nevada would go from 10 uh, to 20. Remember, I'm making up the numbers because I don't even know, especially for Nevada. Um, so they go to, to, from 10 to 20 uh, after 10 years, like this huge, huge movement to Nevada for whatever reason. So they have to redraw these boundaries. All right, that's what's called the redistricting. And here's where the um, uh, corruption can slip in. The Constitution gives that job to the state legislature, or to the states, basically. So 
in most cases, the state legislature that redraws these districts. And you're like, yeah, okay, whatever. That's actually something that can be misused um, uh, and, and, and used in a corruptive manner. So, states in charge of districting themselves. And in the case of 25 states, that means that the state legislature is going to be the one that um, draws these districts. So out of these 43, I think we have 25 states uh, use the state legislature. So they would form a committee or however they do it in their individual state, and they would draw up the 20 districts however they wanted to. Um, we have, I think, 13 states use uh, independent uh, 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 groups. So they'll, they'll form a bipartisan group, meaning uh, it's not just Republicans drawing the line or just the Democrats drawing the line. It's a, a bipartisan or independent group doing it, um, and that's to reduce corruption. So yay, states that are doing that. Uh, not that every one of these 25 states does, but... Uh, and then I think five states do a mix of both. Five states, uh, you have the uh, independent group suggests to the uh, state legislature. Generally, you want one of these two so that they do it more evenly uh, and fairly because, and this is uh, definitely a corrupt form of um, redistricting, uh, where, let's say, for example, I'm one of the 25 states where uh, my state legislature does it. If the state legislature is majority Republican, they could draw these uh, um, districts to uh, strongly favor a um, Republican uh, Congress. So they could, let's say you've got 50% Democrats and 50% Republicans in Nevada. I'm just, again, I'm just making this up. You could actually draw districts in a way so that uh, Republicans have way more House representatives than the Democrats do. So let's, let's, let's pretend that's, that's the case. Uh, this, by the way, is referred to as gerrymandering. This is um, uh, prone to gerrymandering. And gerrymandering is uh, drawing uh, district lines for the House of Reps. It could be for anything, by the way, but we're, we're talking about the districts for the House of Representatives. For House of Reps, according to party, or to favor a specific party. And that's actually quite, quite, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's quite a big issue. It's quite a bit of power, actually. Because you, you could, again, if you have a Republican or a Democratic uh, majority state legislature, you could determine how many of your uh, House of Representative members, in this case 20, in this hypothetical Nevada situation, uh, even though it's half and half in this state, hypothetically, you could send, you could draw the lines in a way so that, you know, 17 Republicans go and three Democrats go. Or let's say the Democrats have control of the state legislature. You could do the reverse. You could have a, a, a reapportionment where 15 Democratic members go to the House of Representatives, uh, but five Republicans do. And you can do that just based on how the actual lines are. So there are some tendencies, usually in population, that vote a certain way. So, for example, in big cities and along the coasts, it's much more common for those areas to be inhabited by people who are generally Democrats. Um, the more rural I am, um, those sorts of uh, states or counties or areas tend to be more conservative Republicans. So, knowing that information, I could um, draw lines specifically that uh, put all the Democrats into only a couple districts, even though they're half the state, and give a bunch of districts to Republicans, or vice versa, if I'm a Democrat st state legislature, I could draw in a way so the Republicans get screwed and the Democrats get a whole bunch of set. I can do it inside of a city. Like I could take a city and let's say, oh, well this side tends to be more wealthy, and this side tends to be more uh, poor working class, uh, and, and a good rule of thumb there is the more wealthy group tends to be, but not always, tends to be more Republican leaning, and the uh, lower income, more working class uh, neighborhoods and homes tend to be, but not exclusively, uh, democratic. So you could do that even within an own city, but let's just for sake of argument say, Nevada here, 20 districts to uh, redistrict. 
And they've got 50% of the state is a Republican and 50% is Democratic. But let's say the state legislature is by majority, in this case, is majority Democrat. All right. And again, this could be Republican too. They could do the exact same thing. All right. I've got um, a bunch of cities. Um, and here they are. And let's say all the big cities are majority Democrat. And then all of the uh, rural areas are majority Republican. I could do something ridiculous like this. I could say, uh, here's one district. Here's another district. Another one, 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 another one. So that's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And then I say, there, there, there are 16 um, uh, uh, districts. And you know, since based on the population, that almost certainly these districts are all going to vote for uh, House members that go to the House of Representatives of Congress as Democrats. And you take all the rest of the territory, and then you go, okay, and then we got this one. Uh, here's the other one, and here's another one, two, and then there's three. And there's four. So that's all the space in between uh, these little circles. Uh, that would be one, two, three, and four. So now, because of the way I've drawn it, let me use, I don't have any blue. Democrats could be green for this one. Uh, now I've got all these different uh, districts that are for Democrats. I can't remember, did I have 15 or 16? 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, so 16. Uh, and then, of course, the 1, 2, 3, 4 would be all the areas between, and those are Republicans. So that would be uh, five, sorry, four, four Republicans and 16 Dems uh, to the House for Nevada. And uh, was this a fair and equal uh, re redistricting? No, that would qualify as gerrymandering. And again, you could reverse this. If I just reversed it, and said, oh, the Republicans were the majority of the state legislature. They could do the exact same thing for the Republicans. They would draw it differently so that somehow they had a massive advantage on House members that were sent. So gerrymandering has uh, resulted in some very weird looking districts. Um, like I said, they've even taken cities like Chicago and drawn these ridiculous lines uh, to make districts to keep certain neighborhoods that were uh, majority one economic class or majority one race. Uh, to try to get more uh, House representatives that are um, uh, of their particular party. So generally speaking, you want a state, hopefully, that is using some sort of independent agency to draw the lines, or at least suggest them, uh, or hope that the uh, state legislature is close enough or moral enough, good luck with that, and, uh, to make these things relatively fair. Uh, and if you ever want to see some examples, just Google gerrymandering districts and you'll see the ridiculous uh, looks on some of these districts um, where state legislatures have clearly uh, modified these to favor their own party. Uh, nonetheless, that's about all the specifics we're going to talk about regarding the legislative branch, and we'll talk about the executive branch uh, next week.